Thank you so much, Suzanne, for that kind introduction. And also thanks to Nick. Um, I need to drink water while I'm talking, so I'm going to take off my mask while I'm talking, and I hope that's okay. I'm really grateful for the invitation to speak to the community of medievalists at Fordham, and especially to be um, speaking on the occasion of the first of these in-person gatherings. And I'm also grateful to those who have joined virtually for coming today. In some ways, this topic um, that I'm addressing is one that I've been working on for a very long time. For more than 25 years, I've been studying how medieval people imagined the shape of the world and their place in it, both through cartography and travel narratives, uh, sorry, both through cartography and through travel narratives. And so this aspect of the paper feels very familiar to me. Over the last few years, however, I've been thinking about what it might mean to anchor our work in medieval studies, a field that is increasingly imagined in global terms as a global Middle Ages, in local terms. What is the relationship of, or we might ask, what is the tension between the global and the local? There are many ways of addressing this question, and the one I'd like to focus on today begins with the land that we are on, that is the Rose Hill campus of Fordham University. This land is situated between two rivers. To the east, the Bronx River, originally called in Lenape language, Aquahum, which means a place that is protected from the wind. And to the west, the Hudson, originally called in the Mahican language, Mahikantuk, and in Lenape language, Shatemok. These two names reflect not only the distinct Mahican and Munsi communities located along the river, speakers of closely related Algonquin languages, but also the distinct natures of this tidal river, which, as the name tells us, flows both ways. We know the names of these rivers, one on each side of the land that we're on, because of settler colonial documents. For example, the name of the Bronx River appears in a land deed dated March 12, 1663, written as the River Aquahon or Bronx. The Lenape and Mahican names for the Hudson River survive in a similar way in colonial documents. But the interpretation of these names comes from today's Lenape speaking communities, including speakers of both Munsee and Unami dialects, where language revitalization is central to ongoing efforts to strengthen tribal and First Nation sovereignty. Lenape people are present here and now, are still here as the Delaware tribe at Bartlesville and the Delaware nation at Anadarko, Oklahoma, the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians located in what is now Wisconsin, and the Delaware nation at Moravian Town and the Muncie Delaware nation, both located along the Thames River in what is now Ontario. In addition to these federally recognized tribes and nations, there are also state recognized Lenape tribes including the Ramapo Lenape Nation, the Nanticoke Lenape Tribal Nation, and the Powhatan Lenape Nation, all three of these in New Jersey, as well as the Lenape Indian Tribe of Delaware, plus smaller communities located in Kansas, Pennsylvania, and New York. It may seem odd that in a presentation addressing the field of medieval studies, I'm talking about the present moment, the land we are on, and the Muncie Lenape language originally, originally spoken here. But this starting point is, I think, essential to the work we might hope to do as medievalists and more generally as humanists. It is necessary to account for where we stand, both as individual persons and collectively as a member of the communities to which each of us belong. Moreover, it is not enough to uncover the layered history of the land we stand on. We need also to connect with those who have relationships to this land and to build our own relationships with them in a way that is not extractive, but rather mutual. This is a tall order and it is not work that can be done overnight. But I want to suggest carried out patiently and persistently, it is work that is worth doing. In urging patience, I am guided by the words of Taryn Andrews in her powerful introduction to a special issue of the journal English Language Notes titled Indigenous Futures and Medieval Pasts. Co-edited by Andrews along with Tiffany Beachy, this special issue came out last year in 2020. And in the introduction, Andrews explicitly cautions non-Indigenous scholars to, quote, recognize the limitations of Western epistemologies and methodologies, which she says, all too often result in good intentions that are fundamentally appropriative and complicit in ongoing Indigenous erasure. The solution, Andrews suggests, is to take it slowly. She states that we need to, quote, slow down medievalist engagement with Indigenous studies, to be more deliberate, to be thoughtful, and to consider first the ethics of kinship and reciprocity. In that spirit, I would like to try to model some of what I've learned over the past few years. And in the last part of this paper, I will talk in a personal way about developing these relationships. I do so 
in order, not in order to suggest that this is the only way of taking seriously the relationship of the global and the local, but simply to model one possible pathway. For help along this path, I want to express my gratitude to Taryn Andrews, to my teachers in Lenape language class, Karen Mosco and Ian McCallum, and above all to the late Lee Maracle, who put my feet on this path several years ago, though I don't think either one of us knew it at the time. And this talk is dedicated to her. In the remainder of my time with you today, I'll begin by outlining the shape of the world in the book of John Mandeville, focusing especially on the ways in which geography and climate dictate the nature of all living things on the face of the earth, both plants and animals. For human beings too, their physiology and anatomy and even their behavioral qualities are ordered by geographical location. Language is also orderly, distributed across the map in a way that illuminates universal history and its repeated cycles of dispersal and regrouping. I'll then turn from Mandeville to another account of geography and climate, this one not global in scope, but local. In 1748, a Finnish student of Linnaeus named Per or Peter Palm spent a year of studying the plants, animals, and people of this region, Lenapaking, um, Lenapaking, ranging from Philadelphia and Southern New Jersey up to New York. Before his, before his return to Finland in 1751, Calm also traveled farther north as far as the St. Lawrence River. In addition to the classification schema of natural history developed by his mentor, Linnaeus, Calm's travels in North America also draws upon the genres of travel literature and ethnography. I'll argue that it is worth noticing the continuities that link Mandeville and Calm's accounts, which illustrate how medieval textual traditions shaped European settler colonial experience on this land. In particular, I'll suggest that the idea of India is central to the vision of the world presented in each of these works. For Mandeville, India is at once a remote exotic location and as the home of Prester John, fundamental to the redemptive history that Mandeville suggests is close at hand. For Calm, India is omnipresent in the form of the Indians whose knowledge of the natural world he invokes repeatedly, not only in connection with specific plants and animals, but also with regard to the universal antediluvian history that Calm believes is encoded in the land itself. After laying out some of the common ground that unites Mandeville and Calm, as well as commenting on their fundamental distinctions, I'll return to the question of language and its relationship to both land and history. I'll do this in two ways. First, commenting on how language is represented in the book of John Mandeville and Calm's travels in North America, and then turning to a brief personal account of Lenape language learning and how work with the community on language revitalization connects to the historical work I'm doing here. I'm hoping that this approach might be useful to others in methodological terms, both in terms of grounding the global and the local, beginning with the land that we are on, and more generally in terms of embracing an ethos of relationality that allows us to reimagine the field of medieval studies and the place it might inhabit in today's world. The book of John Mandeville, composed in French around 1356, was immensely popular. Translated into multiple European vernaculars as well as Latin, it survives in more than 250 manuscripts as well as early printed books. No less than four separate translations into Middle English were produced within 50 years of the work's composition. It is a capacious book, at once an account of imaginative travel suitable to the devout pilgrim and an expansive, even encyclopedic account of the known world. For our purposes today, I wanna to draw your attention to the global system that is sketched out by the pseudon pseudon pseudonymous author, which is at once cartographic, scientific, and historical. The shape of the world in Mandeville's book is defined in geographical terms, invoking the schema of the Mapa Mundi or world map, and also in terms of climate. North-oriented zonal maps on which the various climates of the world are diagrammed are immensely old, and they coexisted alongside the east-oriented form of Kiel map or Mapa Mundi. Both of these cartographical models are at play in Mandeville's text, and it is clear that the reader is expected to have both of them as frames of reference. This is particularly evident in a passage where the position of England relative to Jerusalem, the traditional sacred center of the TO map, is defined in terms of its relationship to an extraordinarily exotic location, Prester John's land, located in farthest India. Mandeville writes, as far as I can see, the lands of Prester John, Emperor of India, are directly beneath us. For in going from Scotland or England toward Jerusalem, one climbs upward because our land is in the lowest part of the south, sorry, the lowest part of the earth toward the east. And just as far as a person would climb up on one side, he would descend as far on the other side." Unquote. In this passage, Jerusalem functions as a kind of a fulcrum with England on one side, balanced by Prester John's land on the other. Prester John's land is, he says, directly beneath us. In other words, it is opposite, but like the inverted image that appears in a mirror, the same. 
To make the point clear, the Mandeville author adds a brief anecdote concerning a man who traveled so far abroad, quote, that he found an island where he heard his language being spoken, using the same words that one does in his own land, at which he marveled greatly. The narrator adds, however, that I think he had wandered so far by land and by water that he had circled the whole earth, so that he had come around as far as his own borders. And if he had gone a little further, he would have discovered his own familiar land, end quote. In this passage, the sacred center offers a point of reference that allows for the juxtaposition of two different locations, England and Prester John's land, homeland and exotic destination, the local and the unimaginably distant Orient. When we turn to Calm's travels in North America, we will also see a juxtaposition of two locations that are repeatedly placed in comparison. But whereas Mandeville juxtaposes England and Prester John's land, Calm juxtaposes the so-called old world and the new world, Europe and America. In addition, the temporality in each text is significantly different. While Mandeville is concerned with the relationship of his own present historical moment with the apocalyptic time to come, Calm is concerned with what I will call deep history, time that can be recovered only through geological traces and enigmatic monuments. In addition to the cartographic frame of reference I've just sketched out, Mandeville's book draws upon medieval scientific works on climate and its effects on the creatures, whether plant, animal, or human, that live in each particular location. Climate theory provides a sense of the underlying natural order of the world. Bodily diversity is accounted for both in terms of heredity and in terms of climatic influence, though climate continues to be the main focus. The existence of the so-called monstrous races is explained as the consequence of the curse placed by Noah on the descendants of his son Ham following the Great Flood. Their monstrous features, however, are explained as the natural consequence of the climates they come to inhabit in exile, the torrid extremes of Ethiopia and India. For each land described, its climate, which gives each land its distinct properties, is identified as the cause that determines the anatomy and physiology of the inhabitants. For example, in Mandeville's account of the land of the pygmies, the people are said to be only a few spans in height, which is appropriate to their climate. But the author adds, when people of average stature come there to live, their offspring are also diminutive, like the pygmies. The reason for this, he writes, is that the nature of the land is such. Here, climate governs not only the physiology of the native inhabitants of the land, but also of those who only pass through. Um, the land affects not only those who have been there for generations, but also those who come to live upon its soil. This suggests that for Mandeville, the effect of climate are mutable. In other words, the bodily diversity of humanity is not essential, but changeable depending upon the environment. In this, Mandeville resembles the 13th century scientist and philosopher Albertus Magnus, who in his De, De Natura Loci has suggested that if Ethiopians were removed from the first climate to the fourth or fifth climate, that is from the area of the equator to a more temperate climate, within a few generations, they would be altered. In other words, he says, their offspring would have white skin and all the other attributes of northern climates. When we turn to Per Kalm's travels in North America, climate theory will again be a fundamental organizing principle. History in Mandeville's book offers a third interpretive framework for the reader, one that in some, is in some ways more subtle than the cartographic and scientific frameworks we've considered so far. Like the rubrics on monumental Mapai Mundi, such as the Hereford map, Mandeville's book evokes particular historical moments through the place names it cites. The most frequent of these is, of course, biblical history, specifically the narratives of the life of Christ. As Suzanne Yeager has shown in detail, Mandeville's text offers a kind of virtual pilgrimage experience mediated through a series of moments of empathetic engagement that link the devout reader with biblical events, not only the scene of the passion, but also a wide range of moments from pre-incarnational and apostolic sacred history, as well as hagiography. Other historical narratives are evoked as well, however. One of the most striking of these is the life of Alexander the Great. Monumental Mapai Mundi, such as the Hereford map, featured locations that summon up stories of the Macedonian conqueror, including, for example, the 12 cities that he founded, all called Alexandria, the northern gates that were forged by Alexander, Alexander to seal in the unclean nations of Gog and Magog in remotest Scythia, and the oracular trees of the sun and moon located in the distant east, which revealed to Alexander his unavoidable doom. In the book of John Mandeville, we are invited to recall three aspects of the life of Alexander. The first of these evokes one of the 12 cities named after the Macedonian. The narrator states, there is a very narrow pass there to go toward India and therefore Alexander had a city built there that they call Alexandria to guard the city. And now the city is called the Iron Gate. 
In another chapter, he tells the story of Alexander and the inhabitants of the island of Brahmi, located deep in India, not far from the inaccessible earthly paradise. Their virtue is so great that the conqueror himself is awed. Quote, when Alexander read these letters responding to his demands, he thought that he would do too much harm if he disturbed them, and he sent them written assurances that they did not need to guard against him, and that he would maintain their good customs and their good peace, which they had been accustomed. In response to the stunningly faithful and austere message conveyed to him by the inhabitants of a near, another nearby island, Alexander is said to be completely amazed by their answer. The reader is drawn in by Alexander's response, sharing his sense of wonder at the marvel of piety he has witnessed, and is encouraged to recall other related narratives, especially the correspondence with Didymus, an exchange of letters supposedly exchanged by the Macedonian ruler and the king of the inhabitants of Brahmi, which circulated widely among other short texts concerning the life of Alexander, especially the letters of Alexander and his tutor, Aristotle. This encouragement to the reader to recall related historical texts is even stronger in the third episode featuring Alexander in the book of John Mandeville, the account of his role in sealing up the unclean nations of Gog and Magog in the remotest wastes of the North. Alexander had long been identified as the hero who restrained this terrible danger as early as the seventh century in the revelations of Pseudo-Methodius and the Cosmographia of Ethicus Ister. Beginning in the 12th century, however, this narrative was elaborated to identify the nations of Gog and Magog as Jews in a staggeringly anti-Semitic move. While the Mandeville author did not invent this association, which appears in the 12th century in Peter Comester's Historia Scholastica and in Roger Bacon's Opus Maius, it was the book of John Mandeville that put this dangerous and hateful narrative into wide circulation. The Mandeville author describes the remote Northern past where, quote, the 10 tribes of the Jews are enclosed that men call Gog and Magog. He retells the famous story of how Alexander shut them up there behind great mountainous gates, quote, so that they dwell there all locked up and entirely enclosed. And then he explains that, quote, the Jews have no land of their own in all the world except for that land between the mountains, end quote. Based on this passage, it would seem that the place of the Jews in the world is on the remotest edges of the map at the margin of the known world. This is exactly how the gates enclosing Gog and Magog appear on medieval Mapai Mundi, where two tightly connected mountains are shown at the northernmost extreme. In the book of John Mandeville, however, the static scene of the map is expanded into the fourth dimension of time as the enclosed tribes threaten to burst forth at any moment. Quote, men say that they will issue forth in the time of Antichrist and that they will carry out great slaughter of the Christian people. And for this reason, all the Jews who dwell in all lands always learn to speak Hebrew in the hope that when those of the Caspian mountains issue forth, the other Jews will know how to speak with them and will conduct them into Christian lands to destroy Christian people." Unquote. The enclosed Jews appear almost completely alien, separated as they are by the boundaries of language. Even if one of them should happen to escape, the narrator tells us, quote, they know no language except for Hebrew, and so they are unable to speak with the people. The Jews of the cities, by contrast, are both familiar and strange, speaking the foreign tongue of their enclosed kindred, as well as the vernacular languages of Europe. In this paranoid fantasy, there are a kind of fifth column located in the vulnerable heart of Western power. This double place of the Jews, located both within the city and at the edge of the world, is a spatial expression of their ontological status. That is, their ontological status is seen from the perspective of medieval Christians. From this point of view, Judaism itself is understood as at once the wellspring of Christianity and as the so-called old law, that which must be cast off with the advent of the new law of Christ. It is both interior and in that it lies at the point of origin and exterior and that it must be cast off or ejected. The role of the Jews as imagined in this medieval discourse of alterity does not have an exact counterpart in Paracom's travels. The two works share, however, a fascination with the site of origins and the desire to supplant the original people. In Mandeville's book, the site of origins is both Eden and the old law of the Jews. In Colm's travels, the site of origins is reached through scientific investigation of the natural world, through which Colm seeks to reveal a deep history that is prior to the indigenous occupation of North America. In this way, just as the true Israel of the Christians supplants the stiff-necked Jews in Mandeville's anti-Semitic vision, the new world settler supplants the quietly disappearing Indians of Paul's ethnographic narrative. In his entry for September 15, 1748, Pere Calm, newly arrived in America, describes his first encounter with the land he will devote himself to describing over the next two and a half years. He writes, 
I went today to see the town and the fields which lay before it. I found that I had now come into a new world. Wherever I looked on the ground, I found everywhere such plants as I had never seen before. When I saw a tree, I was forced to stop and ask its name of my companions. The first plant which struck my eyes was an andropogon, or a kind of grass, and grass is a part of botany I've always delighted in. I was seized with a great uneasiness at the thought of learning so many new and unknown parts of natural history. This sense of wonder, I had come into a new world, is mingled with uneasiness, the awareness that so much is, he says, new and unknown. Combs' initial momentary hesitancy is seen replaced by a capacious grasp of the natural environment and a desire to order and systematize the plants, animals, and built environments he encounters. Kalm had been selected by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences on the basis of his training under the supervision of Carl Linnaeus, the naturalist whose taxonomic system continues even now to underlie our botanical and animal classifications. His assigned task was to explore the region and to bring back seeds and plants that might be beneficial to his patrons back in Sweden. This aspect of Kalm's mandate is evident at several points in the narrative. For example, he spends many pages on the biology of mulberry trees, having been encouraged to explore the possibilities of developing silk production in Scandinavia. Uh, spoiler alert, it's not working out. <laughs> After some delays at sea, Calm arrived in Philadelphia, and he would remain based there or just across the Delaware River at the town of Raccoon, now called Swedesboro, in southern New Jersey. His heart had been the heart of the colony of New Sweden, but by the time of Calm's arrival, it had been under British control for almost a century after a short period when it was part of the New Netherlands. In other words, this part of Lenape was, so to speak, heavily palimpsested by the presence of different peoples, Lenape natives, as well as Swedish, Dutch, and English settlers. Traces of them appear throughout Holm's narrative, attesting to the layers of history he encountered. Holm kept a careful journal of his time in North America, later revising it into a four volume account of his travels. Only three volumes were published because the fourth uh, volume perished in a fire before it could be printed. The original Swedish text, Ingresa til Nora America, was quickly translated into German, Dutch, and French. An English translation was produced from the German version, and a revised English translation using the Swedish original was published by Adolf Benson in 1937. Kalm's book of travels can be seen within a variety of genres. Travel writing, especially in the sections where he ventures up to New York and beyond as far as Ontario and Quebec. Natural history, in his lush descriptions of various forms of animal and especially plant life. Encyclopedism, in his detailed and systematic account of the natural world, and ethnography, in the sections where Calm describes local practices, whether in the urban setting or in rural locations, enumerating the churches of Philadelphia, the food preparation and farming practices um, on local um, residences, and with behaviors of Lenape people in the region. These last are almost always mediated through accounts by Swedish, Dutch, or English settlers because, Calm informs us, the indigenous people are now found only far inland. He writes, before I proceed, I must mention one thing about the Indians or old Americans. The country, especially that along the coasts in the English colonies is inhabited by Europeans who in some places are already so numerous that few parts of Europe are more populous. The Indians have sold the land to the Europeans and have retired further inland. In most parts, you may travel 20 Swedish miles or about 120 English miles from the coast before you reach the first habitation of the Indian. And it is very possible for a person to have been at Philadelphia and other towns on the seashore for half a year without so much as seeing an Indian." End quote. Elsewhere, Calm underlines the distance that separates Lenape people from the waterways, noting that while they used to harvest shellfish themselves in great abundance, now they have to purchase them in dried or preserved form from others, whether Dutch and English vendors or, quote, native Indians who come annually down to the seashore in order to get clams, end quote. In this passage, as at many other points in Calm's travels, Lenape people appear in a peripheral way at the very margin of the settler's gaze. It is possible to go half a year without seeing these Indians or old Americans, but nonetheless, they reappear repeatedly and periodically throughout Calm's narrative as sources of knowledge concerning which plants to use as medicines which kinds of wood to use for which purpose, or in ethnographic anecdotes that serve to retrospectively justify their evacuation from the lands colonized by European settlers. Throughout Calm's narrative, Europe serves as a kind of foil or point of reference for his account of this new world. On his journey from Philadelphia to Manhattan by way of Trenton, Calm describes his passage through Princeton. He writes, quote, as these parts had been inhabited by Europeans earlier than Pennsylvania, 
more woods have been cut down and the country more cultivated so that one might easily have imagined oneself in Europe. Elsewhere, Calm explicitly evokes Sweden as a point of comparison, juxtaposing the land he now inhabits with the land he left behind. The nights here in general seem very disagreeable to me in comparison with the light and glorious summer nights of Sweden. Ignorance sometimes makes us think slightly of our native land, Sweden. If other countries have their advantages, Sweden also has hers. And upon comparing the advantages and disadvantages of different places, Sweden will be found to be not inferior to any of them. I shall briefly mention in what points I think Sweden is preferable to this part of America and why I, <laughs> as Ulysses did with Ithaca, prefer both to Sweden. <laughs> Tom goes on to enumerate these points of comparison, ending with a criticism of what he calls the careless agriculture that is practiced in New Sweden by the English settlers, who are, he says, careless husbandmen, little better than the Indians who lived in this country for several centuries before the Europeans came into it, but could hardly subsist for one month upon the produce of their gardens and fields." End quote. In other words, Calm describes a continuity of poor farming practices that links the Lenape original inhabitants with the English settlers of his own present day in order, he says, quote, to show the reason why this journal is so thinly stocked with economical advantages in several branches of husbandry. Calm's constant comparisons of America and Europe, New Sweden and Old Sweden have the effect of casting the settlers of this new world in a poor light. The cause of this, at least in part, is climate. Calm explains how the settlers in New Sweden age faster and have poorer health than would normally be expected. Their children, quote, acquire understanding sooner, but the adults grow old sooner than the people in Europe, and the women cease bearing children sooner than in Europe. He adds, those who are born in Europe attain a greater age than those who are born here of European parents. It is very difficult for them to accustom themselves to a climate different from their own, quote. The Lenape people, however, are suited to this climate. Calm writes, I only speak of the Europeans who settle here, for the savages or first inhabitants frequently attain a great age." Unquote. The variability of plant life too is explained by Calm in terms of climate. <clears throat> he writes, there are trees and herbs which the wise creator destined for the Northern countries and they grow there to an amazing size. But the further they are transplanted to the South, the smaller they grow till at last they degenerate so much as to not be able to grow at all. Other plants love a temperate climate, and if they carry either south or north, they will not succeed well, but always grow smaller. Palm goes on to offer sassafras and sugar maples, among others, as examples of this phenomenon. In his account, as in the book of John Mandeville, climate theory provides an orderly system within which all living things are arranged, each suited to its own geographical range, with anatomy and physiology determined by the natural properties of the place. This is a fundamentally Aristotelian system developed through Galenic medicine, which would continue to reform accounts of the natural world through the Middle Ages and into the early modern period. By the time Calm was writing in the mid 18th century, climate theory had become less central, replaced by theories of race that foreground ge genealogical descent as the basis for bodily diversity. The continuity of climate theory in Calm's descriptions of North America, however, is undeniable. I've already commented on Calm's habit of juxtaposing the old world and the new world, Europe and America, old Sweden and new Sweden. He creates a rather different but equally expansive juxtaposition in passages where he refers to linkages between East Asia and America, focusing not on the comparison of settlers in America with Europeans at home, but rather on the comparison of Native Americans, or as Calm calls them, Indians, with Central Asian Tatars. This comparison appears in the latter parts of Calm's travels, where he describes his encounters in August 1749 with other explorers during his time in Canada. Calm mentions the availability of ginseng root in North America, a substance that is much sought after, he says, in Chinese Tartary and Korea, and which sells at a high price in the ports of China. Calm states that when French botanists first saw a picture of it, they remembered to have seen a similar plant in this country. Rightly perceiving that several settlements in Canada are at the same latitude as those parts of the Chinese Tartary and China where the ginseng grows wild, they found the same plant wild and abundant in several parts of North America." Unquote. Immediately after his expansive account of ginseng harvesting and trade, Calm turns to another point of comparison that links North, American, North America with Tartary, the question of antiquities. Calm comments on the original inhabitants' lack of, quote, alphabetic characters, much less writings or books, and the absence of towns and houses, high towers and pillars, which the old world can show from the most ancient times, unquote. 
This lack of monumental structures, Calm goes on to say, is evidence of a lack of history itself. He writes, the history of the country can be traced no further than from the arrival of the Europeans, for everything that happened before that period is more like a fiction or a dream than anything that really happened. Unquote. There is, however, Calm writes, some evidence of another American history, a few marks of antiquity, he says, from which it may be conjectured that North America was formerly inhabited by a nation more versed in science and more civilized than that which the Europeans found on their arrival here. As evidence of this, Calm recounts an account he heard from a fellow explorer, Pierre Gauthier de Varennes, Sieur de la Vendrée, who claimed to have discovered a stone monument located far to the west inscribed with unknown characters. Calm states, several of the Jesuits unanimously affirm that the letters on it are the same as those in books containing accounts of Tataria and are called Tatarian characters." End quote. Calm closes a long passage on the discovery of this remarkable monument by promising to recount another curiosity, namely evidence of Scandinavian exploration of North America, he says, long before Columbus's time. In this narration, the settler colonial impulse not only to dominate but to replace indigenous presence is evident, an impulse that would only become more urgent and more explicit over the following decades, as Philip Deloria has eloquently shown in his 1999 book, Playing Indian. Tom's account of these antiquities can also be compared with other passages in his travels where he refers to what we might call deep history, passages where he looks back into a distant past that is evident only through the shell midden fossil beds and excavations that he discovers during his stay in North America. These are the deepest parts of the layered history that Calm conveys, situated far below the accounts he gathers from Swedish, Dutch, and English settlers, and even below the knowledge he gathers indirectly from the Lenape inhabitants of the region. Calm notes the great quantity of oyster shells that have been reported near the Potomac River in Virginia, and adds that such quantities of shells have also been found in many other places, including New York. By way of explanation, he offers only speculation. Quote, some people conjectured that the natives had formerly lived in that place and had left the shells of the oysters which they had consumed in such great numbers. Others could not conceive how it had happened. Unquote. Calm goes on to note other marvels dug up out of the ground, including human bones of an astonishing size. Here, his explanation of the marvel is grounded not in settlers speculations, but on indigenous informants. Quote, among the savages in the neighborhood of the place where the bones were found is an account handed down through many generations from father to son, that in this neighborhood on the banks of the river there lived a very tall and strong man in ancient times who carried the people over the river on his back. He got his livelihood by this means and was, as it were, the ferryman of those who wanted to cross the river. A deeper dive into history appears in Calm's account of giant's pots great potholes formed by watercourses long ago, and his long description of fossil formations or petrified shells. For an explanation of these, Calm turns again to the original inhabitants. Quote, when the savages are told that shells are found on these high mountains, and that from thence there is reason to believe that the sea must have formerly extended to them, and even in part flowed over them, they answer that this is not new to them, they having a tradition from their ancestors among them that the sea formerly covered these mountains, end quote. Calm returns repeatedly at intervals to such encounters with deep history. These moments mark significant points in his ethnographic travel narrative, where the horizontal synoptic overview of the plants, animals, and inhabitants of North America gives way to a vertical historical engagement with the layered strata of New Sweden, and below that, Lanaparte. Calm seeks, however, to identify a history even prior to that, whether located in Central Asia, in his fantastical account of Tartarian characters found on the Western frontier, or in the biblical flood in his repeated accounts of middens, fossils, and sediments. He seeks a history where the original inhabitants can be located in Asia or within biblical history, anywhere but on Lenape itself with the original people who were and are still here. I'm going to turn now to what should be the second half of this paper, but for the purposes of my remarks today, I purposely kept this part relatively concise. My aim is not to give a full account of what I've learned so far and what I hope to contribute with regard to Muncie Lenape language learning and revitalization. Instead, all I'm aiming to do is to suggest what it might look like to take seriously the recommendations that Taryn Andrews offers in her co-edited special issue of English language notes, which I quoted at the beginning of this talk. Now remember that Andrews states that we need to, quote, slow down medievalist engagement with indigenous studies to be more deliberate, to be thoughtful, and to consider first the ethics of kinship and reciprocity, end quote. 
but what might it mean to consider first the ethics of kinship and reciprocity? First of all, it would mean reading widely and listening to the voices of Indigenous scholars and knowledge keepers. As Andrew points out in the same piece, she writes, recent Indigenous studies scholarship assumes an advanced degree of experience with contemporary indigeneity that many readers simply do not have and cannot easily access. In general, she says, scholars raised outside Indigenous communities and trained outside a dedicated Indigenous studies program lack the theoretical and epistemological foundations to engage with Indigenous studies in a way that does not essentialize and appropriate Indigenous knowledges." What Andrews is calling for here is more than doing the reading, developing a substantial list of books and articles and then working through it. Instead, what is required is an undoing of years of learned practices. For example, Andrews asks, what would it look like to extend an invitation rather than engage with Indigenous studies scholars? Even the language of scholarly debate that we've all been required to learn works against the ethics of reciprocity that is required to join this effort. The kinds of classroom conduct that we cultivate in our students, the idea of winning an argument, all of these work against the kind of scholarly practices we might aim to develop. My own entry into the field of Indigenous studies, or at least the little corner of it I have begun to understand, happened in a very unexpected way. And this is the part of the paper that's a little bit personal. In November 2017, I joined some colleagues at the University of Toronto to organize a workshop on the theme of literature, pedagogy, and decolonization, part of a collaboration between faculty and graduate students at the University of Toronto and South Africa's University of the Western Cape. Language pedagogy seemed like a good topic for us to focus on because many of us were engaged in it and because the colleagues in South Africa had been through the experience of a truth and reconciliation process. And we in Ontario at that time were beginning to talk about how we might implement the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So decolonization seemed to us like an appropriate theme. We held that first gathering, it's very successful. And because it was successful, the organizers, I was one of them, decided to try to do something similar and a little bit more capacious in the um, spring term. This time we thought we would focus not just on literature but on humanities pedagogy more broadly. We were on track to do this second workshop when suddenly there were objections. A letter was circulated stating that our use of decolonization was totally inappropriate. The writer emphasized that decolonization is not just a metaphor, but it requires the actual repatriation of land, about land, water, funds. It's about real things in the real world, not about ideas. Participants had different views about how to respond, but our lead organizer, Nielsen Kortner, immediately recognized that, as he put it, our position was false. So we canceled the event about a week before it was supposed to take place. In the weeks after the cancellation, Neil uh, and another colleague of ours, Uzo Asanwane, and I, we met with Lee Maracol to talk about what might be possible, what we could do if we couldn't do that other thing. She was an extraordinary writer of fiction and nonfiction, a teacher and a Siam or leader of the Solo Nation. She gave her time generously, meeting with our small group several times in preparation for a workshop that took place in October 2018. Four circles over two days focused on Indigenous pedagogy. And she continued to give her time as we planned additional events, a workshop on Indigenous story that took place in April 2019, and another workshop that we did online in February of this past year that was on undoing the privilege of writing. It's very difficult to talk about in the past tense. In 2018, we met in Lee's office at First Nations House for about two hours each time, uh, about four meetings in the spring and then again in the fall. When I think about those meetings, the thing that stands out most to me is stories. Lee used story to explain things, to explain who she was, who her people are, what the relationship between land and people might be, what might be possible for settler people who are guests on the land they live on, what might be possible for indigenous people and settler people to do together, what might be possible up north where we were, and how that might have an effect on people living in other parts of North America or Turtle Island and in the wider world. These stories conveyed so much, and I often will think back to them and understand something different from what I've heard then. After a while, we started to talk about how we might structure the things that we would do together, and Lee explained how decisions are made in different Indigenous communities. They vary widely, of course, but there's a shared practice of something she called the 50 string circle, where you imagine people situated along the edge of a circle, as if each person were at the end of each string. And the point at the center is the knowledge that's sought, or as it's sometimes called, the thing that is cherished and hidden. The group goes around the circle with each person adding something. There's no arguing or even direct questioning in such a circle. Um, and when the circle gets back to the beginning, one person gathers up what they've heard and asks a question that's meant to take the group a little bit further toward the object of knowledge. 
In this way, the group collectively approaches the thing that is cherished and hidden. As you can imagine, this is a time consuming way of making decisions by consensus and by taking time to hear all the voices in the house. But it seemed like a model we could adapt. Accordingly, we set up four circles, two each day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon on four themes. We populated the circles with people who had been eager to present in the workshop that we had canceled in April, inviting more people to fill out the circles. Lee guided the process, especially in developing the first circle, which would set the pattern for all the other circles to follow. And, which one, and this one, the first one, would center specifically on indigenous story. Each circle would have four to five presenters, each of whom would speak for about six to eight minutes. And then there would be respondents who would speak more briefly, as well as a facilitator who would guide the progress of the circle following that traditional model I've just described. Finally, the circle would also include all those in the room in outer circles whose participation would consist both of witnessing and in adding something more if needed when invited by the facilitator at the end of each movement around the circle. Before we started on the first day, I misunderstood how the circle would work. I thought that all four or five panelists would speak and then the respondents would each speak for a minute or two commenting on the overall theme. I assumed that we would then go around the circle in this way a couple of times during the two hours scheduled for the session. But when Lee led the first circle, I saw how it was actually supposed to work. Smaro Cambarelli spoke first about her own experiences of coming to gain some knowledge of indigenous story. And she said how that process included a period of muteness where she couldn't write or I think even speak about what she was learning. There was so much to unlearn as well as to learn. The people in the circle then spoke in turn, each beginning with the phrase, I was struck by or what struck me in listening to you was. In this way, what was added by each person was truly responsive, making a cumulative effort to get closer to what the group was collectively trying to approach, the thing that is cherished and hidden. I was glad to have the experience of doing this shared work, but for a long time, I imagined that this work was relevant only to my pedagogy. I did not imagine that it would intersect in any way with my research. Then I found out unexpectedly that I had the opportunity to take a job that would put me back on the land I grew up on and was aware because of what I had learned from working with Lee, that this would require me to learn about that land, the people who have relationships to it, and generally to listen and be ready to join or support activity that was underway on Lenapoke. Lee encouraged this and when I, when I talked to her about it. And even before I left Toronto, I was fortunate enough to stumble upon Ian McCallum's Twitter, where he would share phrases in Munsee Lenape language. Following that led me in time to a three-day language and history gathering that was being held uh, by the Muncie Delaware Nation on Zoom. That in turn led me to Muncie Delaware language classes online, which, and I feel terrible being grateful for the pandemic, but this was a wonderful thing. The classes were on Zoom instead of in person. And so I was able to join that class and to begin building language skills. There are a very small number of Muncie language speakers and Unami language is in an even more challenging situation in terms of the number of speakers. For both dialects, however, efforts are underway to build learning communities centered on the nation's and tribes' own revitalization initiatives. Universities have a place here, but that place is to support and contribute, not to lead. While I've been doing research for the paper I've offered today on Paracalm and Nandeville, I've also been working on Lenape language revitalization. I have to emphasize that this has been in a small way, but as our language teacher, Karen Moscow, reminds us, each of us brings what they have to offer to the group. One of the challenges in Muncie language revitalization is that some words have been lost over time. This is for a variety of reasons, but in the case of animal and especially plant life, it's because of the forced displacement of Muncie speaking people to what is now Ontario and Wisconsin. The words for oyster and clam, for example, that would have been so important to daily life are not in the modern Lenape language dictionary. They are, however, to be found in the documents of missionaries and other people who are part of the settler colonial enterprise. As in the case of other languages that have undergone revitalization, uh, Wampanoag is a wonderful example. Missionaries' lexicons, sermons, hymns, and translated works can fill in gaps in vocabulary. And Pear Calm can also help in spite of himself. <laughs> because he offers detailed descriptions of the plants, trees, and animals he encounters, together with the Linnaean terminology for them, it is pretty straightforward to determine what the modern equivalent, the actual plant, is. And because we have a surviving Lenape language lexicon by the Moravian missionary David Zeisberger, produced just a couple of decades after Kalm was writing in the Susquehanna River region, not far from where Kalm was living, we can match up the terms in Zeisberger's word list with Kalm's descriptions. Time does not permit me to go into detail, but let me offer just a couple of very brief examples. The medicinal root of ginseng is described in detail by Kalm, but he offers only the Iroquois name for it and not the Lenape. Zeisberger, however, gives us a Lenape equivalent for what he calls Jensi root, which is Wapak. Similarly, Kalm describes 
uh, Verbascum topsis, the great white mulling, which he says grows in great quantities on roads, in hedges, on dry fields, and high meadows. He then goes on to describe the medicinal uses of this plant. Seifberger provides the term for what he calls Aran root, which along with Aran's rod is an old equivalent for mullein. The Lenape word is maksawak. This is likely related to the modern Lenape verb makwisin, meaning to swell up. I say likely because I'm not sure. This is something I'm gonna to have to ask our teacher about in class. There are many other examples, but I'm not gonna go into them now. What's important here is that this is not work that I do by myself or in isolation. It's work I do to contribute through presentations and participation in language class. The relationships developed through that work have been good for me and I believe also good for my work. I'm not suggesting that this is the specific path that anyone else should take up. I do think though that the underlying ethics of listening and learning and of building relationships is one that could be taken up more widely. Begin with the land that you're standing on and then follow it to the people who have relationships to that land, above all the original people who are, I cannot say this enough, still here. The land may also take you to the language or it may take you to other good work. If you take that work up with what Taryn Andrews calls a good heart and the lately miracle has described as a good mind, you'll be on the right path. You'll be attentive to the global, but firmly rooted in the local, whoever's land you're on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, we'd now like to take questions for Dr. Akbari. Um, we're going to uh, hope to incorporate everyone um, tuning in uh, virtually as well. So um, perhaps uh, Dr. Paul is going to uh, moderate uh, one of these uh, in the chat if people would like to offer anything in the chat. I think now would be a good time. And um, I'll be taking questions from the floor um, here at Fordham Rose Hill. Um, so I'd love to hear from you. Yes. Tom. Uh, yeah. Can, can we ask if people at home can, uh, or on Zoom, can hear uh, the question as it's being asked? Go for it, Tom. Let's see. Whether... Okay. Uh, so this is actually a, a fairly simple question. So <clears throat> I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more, uh, though you already talked a lot about it, um, Paracom's genre, right? Because of course, like, I have been more familiar with those missionary narratives, right, mm -hmm. from the Eastern Algonquins, which of course are carrying in so much of the European perspective and get, you know, re and they reanalyze what they see through the different European perspective. How different do you see his perspective as a scientist and as an ethnographer to those more religiously minded um, perspectives? Just because I think that sometimes we can think of them all as just like these people from Europe who are coming and looking at this. Is there a distinction? Isn't there a distinction mm -hmm. between their perspectives based on their genre and their needs? That's a really good. Uh, first, let me ask, do, do you think people heard that question? Okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, no, thank you for that. I, I think it's a, it's a question that's easy to answer and also extremely difficult to answer. Easy to answer in the sense that um, uh, ethnographic narrative is ubiquitous in a whole range of writing, whether it's more on the scientific side and more on the missionary side. That the ethnography is a kind of a constant and it appears in a very widespread kind of way. And there's been some beautiful work been done specifically on Moravian missionaries and the extent to which ethnographic uh, practices uh, permeate their writing. Yeah. So, so that's a, the sort of the easy answer to it, that ethnography is something that exists both on the sort of the, the end of the spectrum where it's much more scientific writing and the end where it's really missionizing writing. The more difficult response is I think that you know genre is always like it's like how can I put it it's it's a it's a fiction right it's it's a thing that we it, it's a it's a container we use to describe the shape of the thing we're talking about and one of the things that's so striking about travel narrative broadly you know, even if we're talking about medieval travel that, that, that travel narrative itself doesn't really exist as a genre right we have pilgrimage narrative we have missionizing texts we have itineraries right? and so when we get into the 17th and 18th century some of these medieval forms, especially missionizing texts, um, still continue to exist, but they're taking different kinds of forms, right? So, so that's that's the really bad answer. Like, I, I a part of it is I think I don't think I've read enough 18th century examples to be able to say how much is called an outlier and how much is he absolutely typical. He strikes me as interesting because, it, for many reasons, but one of them is that he's got the journal format. He clearly kept a journal and also revised it. We know this from the surviving notes and so on, um, but he maintains the journal format. So for him, the, the temporal part, the itinerary part is still very, very important. 
So he revises in order to bring out the thematic kind of continuities, but he doesn't want to lose that calendrical quality. And again, I haven't read enough 18th century comparators to know if that's absolutely typical or if that's unusual, but it seems like it's important to have. So that would be the place I would go to try to understand a little better what he's doing in terms of genre. Another question from the floor here. Yes. Um, I was very struck by the moment when you referred to the notion of a lack of monumental structures equated with a lack of history. And it just sort of opened up the thought in my mind of how often I read or think a lack of blank equates with a lack of history and just to guard against my own, you know, slipping into that kind of thinking um because yeah that it's a dangerous path yeah no i couldn't agree more you know as you're saying that i'm thinking about um other conversations i've had that relate to um indigenous story mm -hmm. right? so story yes. as it's practiced within indigenous communities in an ongoing way and the way in which storying or storying it up these phrases are sometimes used um it's a kind of a dynamic process where story is reworked and made new it's retold uh, as Lee Maracle used to put it, different but the same, right? It's being, um, how do you put that in an anthology? Like, how do you handle periodization? Like, what do you do? With, so, um, you know, th this is not directly responding to your your question, your your comment about, um, you know, uh, you know, how do monuments connect to history? But it, it, but it does connect to this whole question of like, to what extent are our existing sort of epistemological structures disrupted by taking seriously practices that have been here for thousands of years and continue to survive. And um, uh, I mentioned very briefly in passing a um, online set of circles that um, we did back in February of this year on undoing the privilege of writing. And those were very much about this whole question. What would it mean if oral practice was valued and measured in university settings in the same way that we value and measure written work? Right, um, and, and oh, a lot of things came out of that that were incredibly productive. And I was really happy to see just a couple of days ago, um, work that's been done recently um, by uh, people in digital li library science, um, indigenous people in, in that field to, to establish standards for oral evidence, you know, and, and how, to, how, to, how to develop structures that allow you to do that kind of work. So that's a very roundabout way of responding to your comment, but I think it's a really yeah. important thing you put your finger on. Yes, the right comment. Thank you. So we take um, uh, Professor Kim's comment here and then over to the chat. Okay. Yeah. I think that was a um, really great talk. And I have to say, this is my first talk back since the pandemic started, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, but I had a, a kind of a basic factual question, but then I wanted to I wanted to say, ask you a question about stories too that just occurred to me um, from your last answer. So the first factual question, um, it is about the stories that um, um, somehow picked up on stories that indigenous uh, people told about, you know, the, the ancient histories of the Americas. Um, so I know you said at some point that he, those stories were mostly mediated through, you know, his encounters with settlers. So I just wanted to know, did he ever, is there any evidence that he actually talked to somebody who was indigenous? This is a really good question. Um, so in some passages where he's talking about, what, what the Indians or the savages, right? Uh, it's he, he's specific about whose uh, who's account he's repeating and how credible he thinks it is, and so on. Sometimes he's very specific on that. Mm -hmm. At other times, it's a little bit more oblique and it looks like he's getting it secondhand. That is, he's not giving a lot of very specific detail about particular people in the time. There are a couple of examples where he gives, where he, he says this is someone he, he mentions a settler person that he got the story from, but then he gives the particular place and time and local circumstances. So there's a whole range of different kinds of instances. I didn't see any example where he himself is a that kind of exchange. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I mean, it sounds interesting too, his sort of elision maybe sometimes of the origins or, or I don't know. But um, I guess as a follow-up question, then it strikes me that if, if it's true that he didn't talk directly to any indigenous peoples, it's interesting how these stories still made it into his account. and. Seem to really, you know, persist and resonate. So, I mean, even, I'm even thinking back to the first question, Tom's question about genre. You know, 
is there a way to see the stories as another kind of genre with you know operating within his text and mm -hmm. are they just there to support Tom's you know his desired conclusions that you know the indigenous peoples weren't really the original inhabitants of the Americas or is there any way in which the stories operate as a kind of divergent resistant yeah you know sort of a, you know type of discourse yeah, that's a really interesting question. He, um, I think it does both of those things. You know, I think in part, it, it's part of how ethnography works, right? Ethnography uh, as a mode, right? We'll, we'll pick up actual facts and circumstances and we'll describe certain things, but often in the service of a particular vision, right? Or a particular sense of, um, you know, natural hierarchies and so on, right? Like, so, so there's actual factual information there, but it's, it's, situated within a kind of a meta narrative that has an agenda, right? Um, at the same time, I think you're right to be asking, are there moments that kind of, maybe not undermine, but kind of mm, counter uh, that overarching narrative? And one that comes to mind immediately is a little passage I didn't have time to talk about where he described, this is one of the ones where he doesn't describe something he saw himself, but he's very specific about who told it to him and where it took place and so on. So there's a lot of particularity about the incident. And he says how there was a circumstance where there was a kind of a meeting going on between settler people and local Indians, so Lenape people, and that um, they didn't really seem to be paying a whole lot of attention and they were just sort of making marks on a stick. But then afterward, they repeated back everything that had been said. Mm -hmm. um, and that's interesting because of the ways in which it connects to things that we know and um, practices that are, that are still known right, within certain indigenous communities around how how memory pack, how oral memory works, how, how these practices work. So just to give um, another example, at the minutes of the Treaty of Easton in 1758, there's, there's multi-week long meetings that took place between members of different um, uh, uh, you know, First Nations, Indian nations, and um, settlers. And the settler people have like regular secretaries who are taking minutes and read back stuff. But then also the um, uh, stations from the different tribes have their people who come back and repeat the stuff. I mean, they take minutes in their own way. So this moment in Colm's travels is not, not the same as what we see in the minutes of the Treaty of Easton, but it's another example of an awareness on the part of settler people of certain kinds of record keeping and mnemonic systems. Um, and that, that a little bit works against, I think, um, uh, the sort of overarching that Colm, a narrative that Colm is giving us about um, these people's capacity for technology or even basic agriculture. We have a, a raised hand from <laughs> old Sweden, I believe. Uh, Eva Anderson in Gothenburg. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Do we want to you? Okay, now I can speak, sorry. <laughs> Uh, I was just going to uh, say that if you're interested in, in Per Kalm and all the other ones, there are lots of recent research and not all of it in Sweden. So if anybody wants to look them up, there's one thing that's called the IK Foundation, as one word, ikfoundation.org. You don't want to buy the book yourself if you're a student because it's really expensive, but you can get it from the library probably. With uh, they have transcribed and translated all the notes taken by all the apostles of uh, Linnaeus to English, so you don't have to read Swedish. So I just wanted to add that. It's very interesting people talking about Swedish things. <laughs> I was not, not expecting that. <laughs> Thank you for this. Um, I, I don't know how to phrase this as a question, it's just a thing that struck me, which is that um, I'm struck by when you talked about Calm and the calendrical na nature of his um, his work and the sort of way, way we're like circling around, well, what kind of genre is this? And we really want to pin it down and it's kind of has some Mandeville elements, but it also has an element of natural history and Aristotle and there's some neo-Hippocratic elements in there as well, I think. Um, and then, I, I don't know, I was just thinking about maybe it's helpful to situate him as the sort of period before the writing of natural history really gets formalized into like a very hard concrete genre in which those stories about the Lenape and indigenous people would all be subsumed to a footnote mm -hmm. and they get really chatty in those footnotes mm -hmm. and the footnotes are the mm -hmm. best because they have the best stuff. But the formal text is where the author is sort of imposing his master narrative of like, 
how this came to be with the scientific facts. And that's a little like, I feel like that genre really gets hardened in the 1760s onward. Mm -hmm. And like maybe one way to situate this is this period in which like there's sort of composite genres of travel writing in which to um, build on Julie Kim's comment, the Lenape and indigenous people can, they're, I mean, heavily mediated, albeit, but like have a place and sort of have an agency within this period in which the genre isn't really hardened. Mm -hmm. I don't know, that's just a thought. That's really helpful. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to do some more reading right around that period because that would be a really great way of framing his moment and where he stands in terms of genre, but also in other kinds of ways as well, maybe. Yeah. Um, Marianne, and then over to the chat, maybe. Uh, hi, that was very, very interesting. I didn't know what to expect. So this was different. My question is about the larger project and how you define local and global, because they seem that they're very slippery, malleable kind of definitions. So um, at, sometimes you seem to imply that there was a historical perspective. You're a medievalist. We're looking back, but 18th century is not exactly the 14th century. So right. there's not a lot of real comparison there. Um, the exotic with, you know, at times global seems to be exotic and local seems to be what is known. And yet the Swedish guy is describing local as the exotic. And I imagine if you were looking at 16th and 17th century accounts of uh, the British on the great tour of Egypt, you'd find the same kind of thing. So could you expand a little bit in terms of the larger project on what those terms mean? Yeah, no, thank you for that question. And it's, it, and it's one that I'm really happy to talk about more. So one of the things that has not troubled me, that would be the wrong word. One of the things I found difficult to think through with regard to the global turn in medieval studies is what we understand by the global, what it means to you know, think about in terms of globalities, right? Um, there's a real danger that it can be a kind of a colonizing move where we use paradigms that come out of you know, medieval Christian, the study of medieval Christian Europe and sort of impose those on the rest of the world. So there's a danger. At the same time, there's a lot of things that are opened up and made possible by the by the by the global trend. And one of the things I'm really struck by and interested in is the extent to which I'm finding more and more colleagues who are in Islamic studies or in Arabic or Persian studies or in East Asian studies who are really interested in using the term medieval and African studies too, right? And using the term medieval to talk about that part of the world. And so for a long time, I thought, well, one really good way to work with this is to think about regions of connectivity. This is one of the reasons why I was really invested or continue to be very interested in, in Mediterranean studies. And then for me, um, an interest in the Horn of Africa and Ethiopia in particular really grew out of that interest in the Mediterranean and thinking about connectivities, Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, Horn of Africa, Mediterranean. And then once you're in Horn of Africa, it's easy to connect to Indian Ocean, think about connectivity. And that seemed to me really useful. But another way of thinking through the challenges of the global is to, I'm suggesting in this paper, to think about the tension and the relationship of the local and the global. And today I grounded that in talking about where do you stand, which is one of the reasons I wanted to give the paper in person, right? <laughs> because to <laughs> here between the two rivers, right? Um, with you in this place, right? Um, so that's one, one way I think of addressing this question, using the tension and the relationship of the global and the local in order to think about where do we stand individually and as members of the communities we belong to and on the land we're situated on. There are other ways of doing that too. So one of the other projects I was involved with in the last year, which is, speaks very directly to this relationship with the local and the global, is an exhibition at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto that I co-curated, opened in October, it's running through the end of February, if anybody makes it Toronto, um, which is called Hidden Stories, Books Along the Silk Roads. And it's basically uh, about books and book adjacent objects. So um, carrying cases for books, jewelry that would carry small, tiny little format books uh, and so on, related textiles. Um, but it's intensely, so it's a global show, but it's intensely local because all the objects come from holdings in that particular part of Southern Ontario from the Royal Ontario Museum, the Khan Museum, the Ar uh, Western University's collections and the Fisher Rare Book and Manuscript Library. The reason for this is when the pandemic lockdown happened, international loans were frozen. And so we've been talking about a collaboration with the Khan Museum and their director said, anybody got any ideas? And so Phyllis Chakir Phillip, who is one of the curators, um, we, we talked to her and we're like, okay, we got 48 hours, let's write a proposal. And what this did was it let us understand the colonial histories that had produced collections that we had in Southern Ontario. So for example, we had a leaf, uh, a printed poster from the Dunhuang Caves in Central Asia from uh, around 900 um, that had come into the collection 
in a swap between the Royal Ontario Museum, the Royal Ontario Museum and the British Museum uh, in the early part of the 20th century. I think they sent, I don't remember what they sent. They sent something from, I don't know. Anyway, they traded some colonial acquisition. And so it was an exhibition that was global in scope in terms of the objects, local in the sense that there was a hist embedded history of British and then Canadian colonialism that had produced this collection. Not every object in it, but many of the objects. And so that's another way of thinking through the global and the local. And I, I, I find this really helpful because I think uh, if we're going to think about the global Middle Ages or a global turn in medieval studies, I really think we have to ground it somewhere. So whether that's in regional connectivity or whether that's in the relationship to the global and the local, whatever way we do it, I think we re it's really important to think it through. Because otherwise it just becomes a kind of colonialism itself, right? We're just sort of saying, oh, uh, we'll, we'll use this paradigm we developed in the context of thinking about medieval Christian Europe and apply it to the rest of the world. And that's, you know, thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. That's helpful. Well, Nick, are there any questions in the chat? Well, I, I, as you say, I think we've, we've, we've uh, uh, let's see, let's see, um, is it Katerina Fasano has that her hand raised? Could Katerina, would you like to ask a question? Yes, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Okay, sorry. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the, the, the lecture. So I appreciate um, you taking my question. I have a question about uh, your, the methodologies, right? This decolonizing methodologies that you were sort of uh, discussing at the end of the talk. Um, I was also interested, well, I'm very interested in, in, in you know, alternative ways of sort of doing research that is more participatory or action-based, right? As a like as a way of, you know, a new way of of thinking about, you know, presenting the research that is that is specifically discussing indigenous communities, right? Because I think that, you know, there is a, a tension in that if we sort of learn about this new way, like these new ways of knowing from these indigenous communities that is oftentimes like knowledge that is a, a bit sacred in, in my perspective, right? And then we take that knowledge, right? And then we present research in a very sort of traditional academic setting in a way. I mean, where is that? To me, there is a, a, a now a, a way of thinking about this as more of a new, new colonialism right, in the way that we are approaching the research that we're presenting. I, I, I'm not sure. So my, my question is more of like the methodology as a, is, is this a way to inform the research or is that a way of learning as a way of also being, my, being mindful of, of, of our own research study? Like, I don't know if you, if you understand what I'm trying to come, like, say here, yeah. but yeah, yes, I, could, yes. I, I, could, I couldn't agree more, and, and I really appreciate you emphasizing this. That is, the, the worst possible thing would be for there to be an indigenous term in medieval studies, and this would be the fashionable thing to start doing. Like that, I think that's this yes. <laughs> exactly wrong, right? And um, this is one of the reasons why I was repeating Taryn Andrews and judges to slow down and, and, and be mindful and think carefully about what you're doing. And um, that one of the reasons I made this paper so disjunctive, like there's the first two parts where I'm doing one kind of thing and then the third part where I was doing something completely different was to kind of bring out that, the, that, that it's not just a question of assimilating a body of knowledge into the way we've always done things. That's absolutely not what I want to suggest. Um, on the contrary, what needs to happen, or at least what I'm suggesting would be good, would be to develop a, a, a web of relationships to be sure that in those relationships, you're always uh, returning or offering at least as much as you're getting out of it. In other words, that it's, it's a set of obligations and responsibilities that are on you rather than a set of privileges. Um, and so like, I don't like, I don't claim you speaking for any kind of position of authority. I'm just sort of passing on what I learned. Again, I'm being really mindful of something that I remember Lee Maracle saying, which was that if somebody gives you knowledge as an obligation that comes with it, your obligation is not to tie it up in a bundle and put it away, but rather your obligation is to make it active in the world, to, to share it again. And so in that light, I feel like it's worthwhile for me to say, not, not go do this thing, but this is what I've been doing. And these are the kinds of um, things that seem to me valuable. You might want to consider what that would look like for you and whose land you're on and who are the people who are connected to that land would be where I would suggest starting. Wonderful. Thank you so much. 
Well, thank you. Thank you. I think we, maybe we could take one more mm -hmm. question okay. from um, Christiane J. Gruber. Can, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Suzanne. That was a, a wonderful talk. I'm, I'm one of Suzanne's Islamicist colleagues out there in the world. And um, I love how we're converging because during COVID, I started learning Kurmanji Kurdish um, so I could work with the Kurds and the Yazidis. And along the process, and this is sort of where the, the strange uh, Eureka moments happened, I found out that the dubitative only exists in Ojibwa, so the, the local language here in Michigan, and in Kurmanji, oh, wow. which, got, which got me thinking when we speak in English and we present our research, we don't have a verb form to convey um, a lack of knowledge that we're always promoting ourselves through an authoritative voice because it's not embedded in the verbs or, or even in the pronouns, right? In, in Kurdish, you don't have the distinction between he, she, and it in, in the pronoun either. Mm -hmm. And my instructors who are language activists say that uh, you know, a concocted word from the outside uh, from those who mean well, uh, such as maybe myself, is tantamount to linguicide and another form of thought settle or colonialism. And so I've been really struggling uh, with this lately and I'm wondering what your insights might be to overcome the, the sheer problem that we have when we have this monolingual authoritative carrier of our thoughts that is the English language. How do we cope with that? Um, how do we sap and undermine it in ways that are not a la mode or uh, fetishistic, but are truly engaging of the plurality of modes of being in the world, one of which is primarily linguistic? Mm -hmm. I think it's an, an incredibly good and an incredibly difficult question <laughs> because um, we exist within the structures we exist, right? We've, we're not gonna avoid having whatever the current cosmopolitan language of discourse is, right? We're not gonna be able to get outside of that. What we can maybe do is draw attention to it and be aware of it. And in taking up opportunities like what you were describing in, um, uh, in uh, engaging with Kurdish language and then uh, uh, a good comparator language, Ojibwe, uh, from your, the territory and the land that you live on, that allows you to defamiliarize certain things and see things clearly that would otherwise not be visible. So to speak from my own experience with regard to Lenape language, one of the things that I've been really interested in thinking about is as an Ojibwe, you know, there's, there's no he, she in it. It's just one pronoun. There's also, um, you don't have, um, have to, but you don't have gendered nouns, like, you know, like you would in French or German or something like that. Um, instead, nouns are animate or inanimate, right? Which is gender in a purely linguistic sense, but doesn't carry any kind of bodily connotation in quite the same way, right? It's about animacy. And then there's all kinds of things that open up around that, that de defamiliarizes the language that we, we mostly live in, in English, right? Um, or for example, the ways in which Lenape language, so many formulations are, are verbs. So for example, the verb, I would wanna say, you know, something is red. I wanna say, this is red. I would say in Lenape, I would say mokso, which means it's being read. I mean, it's just a verb, right? And, and, and so we can't replace the language that we live in with these other languages, but by learning them, it pulls us out of the zone of um, invisibility, I think, that we, we exist in in our like, cosmopolitan languages um, and, and allows us to see things that are otherwise effaced. And so, so I would love to hear more about what you've been learning and doing that work. That's interesting. It's like a, a Brechtian distanci distanciation, right? The fifth, <laughs> the fifth act, you'll have a little chorus on the side. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, maybe, maybe. Thank okay. you. Thanks, everyone. All right, um, wonderful, wonderful ideas today. Um, let's give our speaker a round of applause. Thank you.